This is a, this is a known fact. One of my great friends, Scott Dawson, who's, excuse me, who's preached in this church, going to preach here again soon, worldwide known evangelist, posted this this week. Now, I've already known this, but these are updated numbers. This is from Barna Research and other researches. It says this, if a family member comes to Christ, the influence they have on the rest of the family coming to Christ. Watch this. If a wife, this is not belittling to any women or children. If a wife comes to Christ, 18% effect in, will influence the rest of the family coming to Christ. A wife will affect her husband and her children 18% of the time, and they'll all come to church. If a child, now watch this, if a child comes to Christ first, that child has a 22% chance of winning the rest of the family. 22%. Do you understand why we got children's ministry? That ain't just so we can babysit. We're training up leaders and warriors and prayer warriors that some of them, their parents, drop them off at the front door. That We got kids that parents come to the front door and drop them off and leave. Now, I love y'all. If y'all watching online, I'm not mad. I'm glad you're bringing your kids. But how about this? Follow your kids on in. Because this ain't just something for you to drop your kids off so y'all can go do your thing. Jesus wants to touch you too. All right, here we go. 22% of the family gets, goes to church if a kid gets saved. I want, to see you, I want to show you why the enemy came after the father. 18% wife gets saved first, family comes to church. 22% kid gets saved, family comes to church. The dad gets saved First, 94% of the time, the rest of the family comes to church. 94% of the time. Is that crazy? Do you understand the intentions of the enemy? That's why. 94%. Now, I don't know what some of y'all folks been praying over me, but I can, I can feel y'all praying some militant prayers over me. I can feel it. I can feel it, man. I'm talking about, I got, I'm, I'm operating on, let's see, four and a half hours sleep. This is, I used to say this is spark and Holy Ghost, but I had a cup of coffee before I came out here. And you'll be proud to know you true coffee drinkers, I put just a little bit of cream in there. I'm backing off that. In fact, I took three drinks with nothing, just straight black coffee. I'm growing up, y'all. I'm growing up, being a man. Now, not only is there an attack against the family. I don't know if y'all going to handle this. There is an open attack. Against manhood. Huh? Against masculinity. I'm not talking about chauvinism. I'm not talking about male chauvinism. I'm not talking about talking down to women and disrespecting women. That's not a man. That's a coward. That's a punk. Huh? Somebody needs to lay hands on him suddenly. That's all I'm going to say. But I'm talking about where are the men? It is time for men to be men. And I got news for you. The world trying to tell you that women, I'm talking about true women that attracted to men. I mean, I don't mean true women attracted to men, but women attracted to men. If you're true, you're a woman, you're a woman, period. No matter who you're attracted to, you're still a woman. But that wants a man in their life. I dug a bunch of holes today. But they talk all they want to. I, I, want, I want somebody that's in touch with their feminine side. They want that at the movies. They don't want that in life. 
They want somebody that's going to stand up against the devil and fight for you. They want somebody that's going to stand between the living and the dead and say, get your hands off my wife. You better back up. Get your hands off my kids. trying to preach this. If the Lord lets me do this, next week, I'm going to preach a message called The Rest of the Story. I'm going to close this out, if the Lord lets me. And I saved this one for the one I thought was, I think is the last one. The Rest of the Story, Jesus. I'm going to preach to you you think you know the story of Jesus, but I'm going to tell you the rest of the story of Jesus. Because we have limited Jesus. We have put Jesus in a box. We've turned Jesus into a painting or a statue with his hands always like this. Or maybe like this. I promise you this. If he's facing the devil, he wasn't facing the devil like this. And I got news for you too. I don't care what your painting, what your books have. He, what, he did not have blonde hair. He did not have blue eyes. And he wasn't a sissy. Every movie I've ever seen, Jesus walking around like this. Satan. Come out. He was the son of a carpenter. He was a brawny man. Come on, can I get somebody? He was probably a good looking man. Because how many knows you ain't going to make the son of God ugly? But he wasn't no blonde haired, blue eyed, lamb toting sissy. Some of y'all think he just carried a lamb around with him all the time going, I'm a shepherd, so I need to remind you. Sheep, you're, you're a sheep, you're a sheep, so that's why I hold this sweet little sheep with me. For there is nothing, I wish I, I'm trying to preach this message. There are people in this last day revival that will never be known nationally. They'll never have a big time Instagram or Facebook following. They'll never, they'll never go viral on YouTube. But there will be people in the influence of those men and those women in the local arena who will change the world. Who will be known. Who will touch thousands. But they will be traced back to the faithfulness of the unknown. The unnamed and the unnoticed. Are you hearing me? Everybody wants a big name. All these preachers, they watch the big preachers. I was one of them. Mine was Rod Parsley. Y'all know how I felt about Rod Parsley. I preached like a mimic to him. Preached his word, sermons word for word. And there's nothing wrong with that when you're, when you're young in the Lord and you're emulating. Your, I'd rather have a hero that's a preacher than a hero of some of this other mess that we put heroes out to be out there. I'd rather, I'd rather our kids' heroes be a preacher, praise God. I'd rather them grab a hairbrush and stand in front of a, a, a mirror and pretend to preach like some preacher than, than to try to act like somebody that's using the F word, every other word, disrespecting uh, women. Come are you here disrespecting their own bodies my god are you hearing me i see greatness in you I see greatness in you I see greatness in you those hidden jewels those hidden precious faithful servants the bible says you're faithful over a few things i'll make you ruler over much ruler over much doesn't mean big time big name it means influence it means generational blessings. Mark 4.22 says, For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. In other words, God said, I know everything that everyone is doing. I know their faithfulness. 
Can I tell you something? I'm, I'm doing this to toot my own corn, but, I'm, but, I am, but I am appreciating and honoring this house. Nobody knows what we've had to go through to get here. When I run into people now and I tell them where I pastor, and I tell them where it's at, you know what they say? Oh, that's that big church. I know exactly. That big, giant church is on Highway 79. Got the big flagpoles out there. Got the ball fields in the back. Oh, yeah, man, you, that church is massive. Wow. How many of you running? Their, their mind immediately goes to, oh, you, you the church, that big, that big building. They don't know nothing about the hay barn. They don't know nothing about the little white building. They don't know nothing about 2 o'clock in the morning putting ceiling tile in. They don't know anything about getting ready for our first service. And we started working at 6.30 that morning. And we were still working at 3 a.m. the next morning. About seven or eight of us. Putting the last ceiling tiles in that we could. Or not ceiling tile, but grid. And, and trying to get something going. Pushing through, sweating, stinking. Knowing we got probably two or three hours to go home and get dressed and get ready and back then I put on a three piece suit not a three piece but a suit and a, and a tie and be back in that place with a smile on their face and I back then I, y'all think I preach a long time now back then I preached sometimes two hours I, I preached so hard and so long but sometimes they had to carry me out had to have men literally pick me up and carry me out of the building take off my shoes and I'd wring my socks sweat had already run all the way down in my socks my socks was like I just stepped in a swimming pool But God knew about that. No, people made fun of us. People laughed at us. People mocked us. Sitting on 30 acres of, of pasture land, side of the hay barn, parking on a Wednesday night, five cars, in a place where 500 could park, putting cones out with flashlights, spirit of excellence, teaching our leaders when we didn't even know what leadership was. If we can't do it for five cars, God's not going to bless us with 50 cars. So we operate now the way we will win because we know what God is going to do in our lives. So we, we don't wait to get there to do it now. We, do it then. We do it now. We operate on this praise team as if already hundreds of churches are singing your songs. When you write a song, you're working on a song, you tell yourself. You see, not for a pride or prestige thing, but an influence and a legacy thing. You see people that you don't even know. Many of them you will never meet. They will stand on platforms and they will sing your songs and the glory of God will fall. And souls will be saved. Bodies will be healed. Marriages will be restored. Because of your faithfulness, because you see the influence of the moment. Because God has saw you come from nothing to what you are. Which is literally one of the best praise teams to be found anywhere. I'm hurrying. Matthew chapter 6 says this, Take heed that you, do not, that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues of the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed... Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now, there's, there's, I'm not talking about that it's wrong to take a picture of you uh, putting shoes on somebody in Peru. Oh, and by the way, Peru crew is back on American soil. Praise God. Just so you know, they're back safely. They made it safely back. Had a tremendous, tremendous trip. Cannot wait to get the update and results. I actually was able to get a couple of video updates from them to their pastor while they were there. It's incredible. There's nothing wrong. You got a bunch of people that's just, I, I call them uh, the Karens of the church. No, no offense, Karens. You know, that, we, that term came up during the pandemic. But, but then, you know, they're so holy, they're, they want to make fun of people and post that it's wrong for you to have a picture of you handing out food to somebody. You know, why don't you just hand out food and never take a picture of it? it there's nothing wrong with that unless that's your pure motivation. 
Sometimes you post things like that to inspire people, to show them how, my God, I want a church like that. I want to be a part of a church that, where's that church at? I want to, I want to be a part of something that has a heart to help people. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about people who do it for that reason, just to be known. But, but God said, I see in secret, and I'll reward you openly. See, we know Adam. We know Eve. We know Noah. We know Abraham. We know Daniel. We know David. We know John the Baptist. We know the disciples. We know Paul. We know Jesus. I could go on and on and on. But there are so many anonymous servants of God that is the church's rest of the story. We're here over 2,000 years later still preaching the same gospel, not because of the famous names, but because of the not-so-famous names. Some of them are famous, but you got to dig to find them. you got to go back and read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs and see the things that some of the people went through and struggled for the sake of Christianity. While we think we're being persecuted, can I tell you something? You, we don't know persecution. Right now, all around the world, by the way, it may surprise you, but more Christians are being martyred today, right now, around the world than any other time in history. In history, thousands of Christians are being killed every year around the world simply for their faith. They're being beheaded. They're being stabbed. They're being burned. They're being shot. They're being killed. And, And what is not being reported is that multiple people have been killed for their faith in this country. Persecution. It's, it was then and it's coming again now. But those that were faithful, those that were dipped in tar and nailed to a pole on a Roman street and set on fire while still alive to be used as a light post as the Romans went to their games laughing and mocking The recorded history is that as they burned on those poles, they sang praises and psalms to God as they're breathing their last breaths, burning every square foot of their inch of their body was burning alive, but would not deny Christ. It is that kind of faith that caused others to see that. Just like what I preached to you a few weeks ago with Saul holding the coats as they were stoning Stephen. Can you imagine those that walked by Started out mocking and laughing, but by the time they got to the end of the, of the road, about to go in that game, they could not shake that image. What? What would cause someone to be that faithful to a cause? And many of them would sneak in the middle of the night and tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me about your God. Tell me about your God. It's the unknowns. The rest of the story of the church is not built on the foundations necessarily completely of the famous one. It's built on ones that we'll never know until maybe we get to heaven and we may never know even then. We wouldn't even know to even ask them if they were them because we don't know. We think about the temple. I thought about this this week. I was thinking, you know, we hear about the temple. We hear about the temple's glory. We hear about the priests going in. We hear about all the things. But nobody talks about the ones that built the temple. There was thousands of people that, that, that had to chisel the stone and carry the stones up the, up the mountain. There are people that built the house that nobody knows but God knew. We know the story of Gideon. Preached about it not long ago. We don't know the names of the 300 valiant, brave soldiers that stood with Gideon. There is no Gideon story without the 300 that stayed. Gideon was probably not going to go into battle by by himself, but God said, I'll use these 300. So so the rest of Gideon's story is 300 unnamed people. We know Gideon, but we only know Gideon because of 300 that we don't know. Elijah, the prophet that we just talked about, prayed fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel. And then he heard the words of Jezebel that he was going to be killed. And, And the same thing he did to the prophets of Baal was going to be done to him. And fear gripped him and he ran. For his life, he starts saying things to God like, I'm the only one left, God. I'm the only one left. It's just you and me. Because all he knew was about himself. But God made it very clear, I know more than you know. God's response was not to Elijah, well, yeah, yeah, you're my prophet. You're the man. No, he said, let me tell you something, son. There's 7,000 people right down the bottom of that hill that's never bowed a knee to Baal. And I know every one of them. 
That's what he told him. They've never, ever bowed a knee to Baal. 7,000. And I know every single one of them. You don't know them, but I know every single one. You just thought you was the only one. That tells me he didn't have no idea about the 7,000. But God made it very clear. I know every one of them. And I've watched them, and they have never bowed a knee to that false god, Baal. So while you big, high, and mighty think you're the man, let me tell you something. Those 7,000 are probably the ones that's praying, keeping you even protected. These big-time preachers that think they're, it's all about them, it's all about them, they don't even understand the praying grandmas in their church that's been laying on their face in the middle of the night praying for their pastor, leading and standing in the gap for their pastor. That anointing that comes on, on me when I'm up here, I understand it ain't just me. It's the prayers of the people, the prayers of the saints. The centurion that came to Jesus, the leper, the man with a, with a withered arm, the two thieves on the cross, the 70 disciples that were sent out, the 10 lepers, the lame man at the gate called Beautiful, the eunuch in the story of the book of Acts, the jailer with Paul and Silas. These are all men that there is no story without these men and women, but we have no idea who they are. But every one of the rest of the stories of the famous ones of those stories are not even possible without them. One in particular I think about is the thief, and I'm, I'm closing. The thief, Jesus hanging on the cross between two unknown thieves. You know the story. If you don't know the story, he's hanging there. He has been unjustly accused. He's accused, Jesus is accused of a crime of blasphemy. Blasphemy is to say as a human things that only God could say. It's blasphemous. For a human to say that. Well, it's not blasphemous if you're God. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. When he said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me, that wasn't blasphemous because he is connected to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God. So, But the two thieves were there because they stole and they were being crucified for probably many other things. One thief, the Bible says, railed at accusations against Jesus. If you really are who you say you are, take yourself down on this, off that cross and show the world that you are the Messiah. Mocking him. The other one says, hey, 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 man, hey, man. I've been a bad person. And I probably don't have any right to even speak, to even speak to you. But this, this is it for all of us. And I'm sitting here thinking about my life. And, and I, I, just got, I just got this feeling that you are who you say you are. So I'm just going to ask you just, I don't even know if it's even possible. But I know he acknowledged that he was king of kings and lord of lords because he said, I know you're going to your kingdom when you die. He didn't understand the full picture of the resurrection or anything. He just knew that when he's gone from, from this earth, he's going to a kingdom. And he said, will you just remember me when you enter into your kingdom? Jesus is moved by faith and repentance. So, so, look, we don't have the words saying, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive my sins and come to my heart. The canned prayer that we now say you know, has to be prayed exactly that way. But Jesus knew that when he said, if, will you remember me this day when you enter the kingdom, that that was him saying, I acknowledge you are the Messiah. You hear me? And Jesus looks at him and says, this day, this day, you will be with me in paradise. What people don't realize is that when Jesus died, the New Testament began. And when Jesus died, the New Testament began, and the thief died. See, the thieves were not beaten to the extent that Jesus was beaten. We don't know when they died. But when, when, he went, when Jesus died and he entered into Abraham's bosom, 
The Bible said he that ascended was also he that first but descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And he went down and he emptied out Abraham's bosom, brought all the Old Testament saints with him out of Abraham's bosom and took, it to heaven, took them to heaven with him. And while he's down there talking to Moses, while he's down there talking to David, while he's down there talking to Israel, while he's down there talking to Isaac, while he's down there talking to Adam, are you hearing me? Everybody's looking around saying, who's this guy that keeps standing right next to him? And, 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 and this, this, this is Larry's unauthorized translation of what happened down there, but this is what happened. He was the first New Testament Christian. He said, I want everybody to, to meet, and he called his name, but we don't know what it is because he's unnamed. But Jesus knew his name. He knows us all, all name by name. He has every hair on our head number. He introduces a thief that was a thief mere minutes ago as the first New Testament Christian. The first one to come with Jesus after his death. So an unnamed, unknown, lifelong criminal is in the biblical history books as the first Christian to ever live and we don't even know his name. Are y'all hearing me? How about this one? Real quick. The, we, we just simply call her the woman with the issue of blood. That's her name to us, right? Do you know who I'm talking about when I say the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years? Her name is the woman who had an issue of blood. That's her name to us, but that's not her name to God. Who touched me? He knew who touched me. It had nothing to do with did, was God all-knowing. He just wanted to illustrate someone just pulled power out of me. So he turns around, we have the whole story because of a woman that got her miracle, and we have no idea her name. He just simply says to her at, at the end of her miracle, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your addiction. You know what that speaks to me? He knows her name, but he called her daughter. Huh? Let me tell you something. I have a lot of spiritual sons and daughters. God has blessed me to be a spiritual father to a lot of people. And I, and I, I mean this humbly. But I, but I try to make a point. I don't do, I don't do it all the time because it would be awkward to do it all the time. But when someone has truly asked me to be a spiritual father in their life, and I'm, and I'm fathering them in their life, I like to call them every once in a while, whether it's a son or a daughter, I like to call them son or daughter. Because they need to hear that coming from me. They need to hear, I acknowledge who you are to me and who I am to you in your life right now. So one of my pastor's sons or something texts me, I try to always reply, thank you, son. Thank you, son. Sometimes it'll come out, thank you, sir, or thank you, brother. But, so, but I try to say, thank you, son. I love you, son. I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you, daughter. Not because I'm trying to make myself out to be anything. I want them to know them that I, them to know I know you in this road. That's who you are to me. So here's this woman who had an issue of blood covered in blood. It was, couldn't stop it. Was considered to be unclean. Everyone else called her in, in violation. But Jesus says, daughter. Are y'all hearing me? Did y'all get what I just said? While the world says she has no right to be here, Jesus turns around and calls her daughter. Telling her, hey, look, I know who you are. I acknowledge you. Unknown. How about this one? This will be my last one. He's known simply as this. The man who lived among the tombs. He's famous because he was demon possessed. He's famous because, be real with you, he ran around butt naked. That's what the Bible said. They tried to put clothes on him. He's so full of demons they wouldn't let clothes down. He ripped the clothes off. They put chains on him, and he would supernaturally, demonically have power to break the chains. No one could contain him. So they said, if you're going to live anywhere, you've got to live in the graveyard, because nobody wants to go to the graveyard. Jesus literally gets out of the boat after walking on the water, lands at a place called Gadara. He gets out. He just starts walking up the hill. 
He's not preaching. He's not teaching. He's just having a conversation with his disciples. And a naked man runs out of the tombs, a, gra a, a, a graveside. They're walking right by going, have you come to torment me before my time? And then, of course, the whole story goes, we, what is your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. Come out. Come out. You're coming out of him. And all of a sudden, the demons say, please, put me in the pigs. Put me in the pigs. He goes, that'll be a good one. Come here, pigs. And he throws them in the pigs. And the pigs say, we don't want them. And the pigs run off the cliff and kill themselves. Now those demons are floating somewhere around America right now. Demons don't die. So, but the rest of his stories, he goes into, he goes into his town and wins the whole town to Jesus after he's delivered. But we don't even know his name. See, you may be unnamed, you may be unknown. But God knows who you are. I believe God is setting you up. I believe he's setting us up for this moment. I'm going to close by saying this, and I'm, 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 this is it. I'm going to pray. biggest thing happening in, in our country and in, in the world, but especially in our country right now, is distraction. We are being crafted and very inten intentionally being distracted. We, dare I say, we are being programmed. Yes. Thank you for your permission, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Can I have another? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Can I have another? We are being distracted from what is really happening. Now, I want to read something to you. I didn't know if I was going to do this. But I'm going to do it. I, listen to me, am not a Republican. I am not a Democrat. I don't know what you are. I'm a child of God. I have friends that are Democrat. I have friends that are Republican. I have politician friends that are Democrats. I have politician friends that are Republican. I don't line myself up with a political party. But I will vote for a political candidate that has a stance that is biblical. I will not vote for a political candidate who has a stance that is anti-biblical and anti-God. Okay? I'm going to read something to you. I am a part of a group called Gatekeepers. Gatekeepers is an association of multiple pastors of all colors, all races, all denominations. In fact, all political persuasions. But we are still friends. Can you imagine that? That we don't always vote for the same candidate, but we can still have lunch and dinner and we still hang out and we love each other. What a concept. So I sent them this text this morning in our group text of all these pastors. FYI, this is very alarming. This was actually sent to me. I don't know if you've seen this. The mainstream media will not tell you this, because I promise you, you have not heard this on the mainstream media. But I have verified it. This is true. I said, make sure you, in the article you read, quote, the reasons for rejection from the official. Listen to me. I'm not making this up. This is absolutely 1,000% authentic. Please make sure you read the reasons for the rejection for the official re um, of, from the re official IRS rejection letter. This was an application to the IRS to be a 501c3 nonprofit. I quote directly from the rejection letter from the director of the Internal Revenue Service. I quote. In their rejection. Specifically, you educate Christians on what the Bible says in areas where they can be instrumental, including the areas 
of sanctity of life, the definition of marriage, and biblical justice, freedom of speech, defense, and borders and immigration, U.S. and Israel relations. The Bible teachings are typically affiliated with the Republican Party and candidates. Therefore, this disqualifies you from nonprofit exemption under IRC Section 501c3. This was in the actual rejection letter. Let me tell you something. Biblical values are not Republican. Biblical values are not democratic. Biblical values are biblical. And you are being distracted while some of this stuff is going on right up under your nose. You need somebody to help you open up your eyes and see the truth of the, because God is about to do it. What is happening in secret, God is about to do openly. You better watch yourself. You better watch yourself. I'm talking to white folks. I'm talking to black folks. I'm talking to Hispanic folks. I'm talking to Asian folks. You better watch the voices that you allow to speak into your life, trying to tell you who to walk and march behind. You better get at the feet of the cross. You better get on your face before God because there is a persecution coming. This is not a Republican or Democratic statement. The body of Christ needs to stand up for what God's Word says. Somebody give a shout if you're with me in this house. I'm talking about praise the Lord if you're ready to be a Bible church. If you're ready to be a Bible Christian. Stay on your feet. I'm telling you, it's stuff is happening. You're hearing every day, boom, boom, every day, same news cycle, same news. If you watch the news and you watch it again when it comes on in 30 minutes, it's the exact same stuff every day, every day. You're being told, every, and listen, we need to know this, but every day, it's, it's, it's what you hear if you watch news in the morning. You're going to hear something about the vaccine, probably just got flagged online. You're going to hear somebody was being murdered, somebody got shot. Come on, you hear me? Am I right? You're going to hear a little bit of the weather. And then you're going to hear a little puppy story at the end. But it's relentless. The world is, is chaos, 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 chaos. But behind the scenes, things are going on that you're not being told about. So you need to, and I'm not trying to tell you to be woke. Because that's a good concept when it first started. But now woke means I don't need God. A lot of folks done gone woke me, and I, I, I'm so woke, I've been enlightened. I don't need to follow that fable thing called Christianity. You can be woke all you want to if, if you're woke to what the devil is doing. Because the devil's working. Somebody say the devil's working. But God's working bigger. Y'all still love me? Happy Father's Day. I mean, what kind of pastor do you want? Let me back up. I love you. I respect you. It don't even matter what kind of pastor you want. I'm going to be who I'm going to be. I'll be me. You be you. And if me being you ain't what you need out of a pastor, I'm praying that you find one that is. But I'm going to be me. Huh? I'm going to be me. And before you think you think you know what I'm talking about, you might not know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all are like, that's right. I knew he was one, one of us. No. No, I ain't. No, I ain't. I'm not one of them. I'm not. If that's what you just thought, no, nope, I'm not. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you down. Because as soon as we just start talking a little bit, you're going to find out I don't line up with you like you think I line up with you. I don't line myself up with you. I don't line myself up with who's running for office. I don't line myself up with what's on a website. I line myself up before what I know I'm going to have to stand before God about. God's going to look. I'm about to give an account. Not to you. Not to a district overseer. A state superintendent. Not to a bishop. Not to another pastor. And I'm all about respect and authority. I might stand before God. And so are you. So while you think you've got this stuff hid, unnoticed, it's not hid. And it's not unnoticed. God sees it all. So you know the best thing for you to do is come clean. He already knows it. He's waiting on you to admit that you are tired of living the lie. 
Nobody's going to ask you what it is. Nobody wants to know what it is. It ain't none of our business. But if you've been dealing with something in secret that you need God to deliver you from right now, because you cannot go another day knowing that you got to deal with this in, in private and in torment. Now, don't think that just because you walk down here, people's going to think, well, he's battling pornography, he's battling this. It's, it's, sometimes it's nothing like that. If it is, then that certainly I'm speaking to you. But I feel like God wants to set some people free. He wants to shine the light. You remember that? You know, I don't like to talk about disgusting things, but, you know, most houses have cockroaches or some kind of bugs. Most houses do. I, don't, I know you're old, my, my house. Well, what, what you're basing on the fact is you're looking at your house with all the lights on. You might be surprised what's crawling across your floor when the lights are out and you're sound asleep and you're snoring. Because when the darkness is there, they feel a freedom to reign. When the light comes on, they scatter. So some of y'all been holding some stuff in darkness and you can't seem to get free from it. You need to turn the light on and you, you need to expose it before God. And you need to openly confess it to God. So if that's you, I want you to come. I'm not going to ask you what it is. It's between you and God. I want to pray for you. Who is it? Who is it? Come on. Only God and you know, and that's okay. That's all that needs to know. Is anybody else? Anybody else? Praise the Lord. I thank God for young people. Come on. How are y'all hearing me? Come on. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm proud of y'all. I'm proud of y'all. I'm proud of y'all. I'm proud of y'all. Come on. Give the Lord a praise for these. This, is, this, this, takes, this takes guts, y'all. This takes guts. This takes faithfulness. This takes guts. This, this, this is major. Is there anybody else? Because I'm telling you, you're right there. You're just gripping. You're just gripping hold of that pew. You're just holding back. You're like, I don't, I don't want people to know I'm battling stuff. Forget about what people think. This, aren't you tired of going through this? Aren't, isn't it big enough for you to just not worry about what people think at this point? Which, by the way, we're not going to think that anyway in this church. Get over that. Three seconds. Anybody else? Preacher's three seconds are the longest three seconds in the history of three seconds. Because he'll say three seconds, and he'll go, two seconds. And he'll wait 30 seconds to say one second. You know why? Because preachers don't ever want to close the altars. My three seconds don't ever end. These altars are always open. Anybody else? Would you stretch your hands towards these who are up here? Father God, right now, come on, raise your hands. You're up here for prayer, raise your hands. It's a sign of surrender. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, as a, ch as a church, we stand in agreement right now. We break every stronghold. We come against every demon spirit from hell that's tormented their mind, that's tormented their life. We either attach themselves to them even internally or, or mentally, emotionally, physically. We, we don't have to scream at the demons. We don't have to scream at the devils. We just simply take authority over them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we just thank you, Lord. Right now, there's a spirit of freedom, a spirit of freedom in this altar right now. These that are standing up here with me and the rest of the church is going to help you. But these that are standing up here that came up for prayer, I want you to say this. And I don't want you to say it to me. I don't want you to even say it to yourself. I want you to say it to God, but I also want you to, it sounds crazy, I want you to say it knowing the devil is going to hear what you've got to say. Let's do it together right now all over this house. Jesus, what you did on the cross for me was enough. It's bigger than anything I am facing. I declare today I am free. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Wash me clean. I confess you as my Savior. I am your child, and it is your will for me as your child to be free. I claim my freedom in the name of Jesus. I declare that the past is over. The secrets are exposed. God, I declare you are delivering me and I am delivered from everything that I have been battling in secret. I don't need a man to touch me. I need you to touch me. So Jesus, touch me now. Heal me now. Set me free now. In the name of Jesus, come on, come on, begin to praise Him. Just begin to praise Him for your freedom. Just begin to praise Him for your freedom. Come on, church. Come on, church. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him for your freedom. Praise Him for your freedom. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. 
I was raised in an environment. I'm not, I'm not, I love my, her, my, my, my legacy, my heritage. I love it. Love it. Thank God for it. But I was raised in an environment that, that basically taught me that the power of God and the presence of God was tied to fireworks and, and being drunk in the Holy Ghost and all that. And I believe in all that. But sometimes simple words in the presence of God without even feeling anything is it, it, you will see it's more powerful sometimes than even in services where people's running all over this place because it's not about that because the enemy sometimes will try to perform for the people to, to grab attention and it goes back to that word distraction from what he's re really trying to do so you have to claim and you have to believe in the name of Jesus the fact that you well, all it took for you to be delivered was the faithfulness and the faith to get out and walk down here. You don't need a manifestation. You don't need some man giving you a confirmation. You just need the Word of God. And the Word of God said that, he, that, he, that it is for freedom He has made you free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. So you speak that over your life. You declare that over your life. You declare that you are free because that is what you are. You are free. Do you receive it? Do you receive it? Do you receive it? Come on, give the Lord a praise right now. Hallelujah.